other theological institution. Thanks for listening to Max World Live, living free through forgiveness. Live on KPOG and webcast1live.com. All right, good morning. It is Friday the 4th of the 4th of September. In the Lord's year 2020, I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is the Friday edition. The Friday edition of Max World Live, Living Free Through Forgiveness. Today we're going to talk about how people see Jesus in you. The Bible teaches us or explains to us many ways how the people that came before you and I, how you could see God in them. Moses' face shone. Um, That's the word they use in the Bible. I think we could probably find a translation that says Jesus' face, or I'm sorry, Moses' face shined, shined, glowed, You know, many different ways we could probably describe how that face looks because Moses is one of the only few to this day that can ever say he saw God. And we saw the fact of that in the fact that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, his face shone shown because he had been talking with God. That's Exodus 34. So today we're going to talk about some of the things that people can see in you where your face shines like no other. All right, good morning. If you are uh, joining us at 102.9 FM KPOG, thank you very much. If you're on the app, that is awesome. And if you're on Facebook, let me know you're there by checking in. Good morning, Mr. Boots. Nice to see you and hear from you. On my end, I'm not seeing the video on Facebook, but I'm inside of a studio app or program. So, James, if you can see my ugly face as well as hear it, uh, let me know. I would appreciate some feedback so I know that I'm doing uh, the right thing. I think I am, but you never know with technology and Mac. We don't go together. It's not like Mac and cheese. It's not even like Mac and bacon. It's more like macaroni and what would not go good with macaroni? Let me think. Hmm liver and onions ooh but to be honest with you i don't think anything goes with liver and onions so all right let's read jesus calling for september 4th in closeness to me you're safe in the intimacy of my presence you are energized no matter where you are in the world you know that you belong when you sense my nearness Ever since the fall of man has experienced a gaping emptiness that only my presence can fill. I designed you for close communication with your creator. How I enjoy walking in the garden with Adam and Eve before the evil one deceived them. Okay, Boots, thanks. Glad you can see and hear me just fine. When you commune with me in the garden of your heart... Both you and I are blessed. I'm going to push pause there for a second. God is blessed by your presence. God is blessed by your presence. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Doesn't that give us an idea of how much he loves us? He feels blessings. And see, we only believe, or at least I'll speak for myself, I only thought that God could give me blessings or you blessings. That I certainly was incapable as a mortal man 
to bless God. See, that's the difference between, that's just one of the differences between relationship and religion. Ask someone who doesn't study the Bible about their relationship with God, about their relationship with Jesus. And I'm not trying to be pharisaical or judgmental here. I believe there are many people, many, many, many people who have the free gift of salvation and is walking through sanctification right now but don't have the same relationship that perhaps you have with Jesus or I have with him. I don't believe that the difference between religion and relationship has something to do with how close you are to God. I'm sure there are many people and I, I don't pick on Catholicism. It, it's my roots. And so I, I, I kind of get the right, I think, I hope, in your mind, I kind of get the right to share with you some of the experiences I had worshiping in Catholicism for, I don't know how many years, 50 years, 45 years. I was an altar boy. I read scripture that I didn't understand. Attended Sunday school, attended Catholic school. But it wasn't until July 20th of 2010 where I really felt that overwhelming relationship. And I, I, I compare that to, for those of you that are parents, that first time that the nurse or the doctor handed you your firstborn into your arms. And... I don't know about you, but I remember that moment. And one of the distinctive emotions that I had at that moment was my life was never going to be the same again. That in many ways, I, 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 I came up to a brick wall and there was only right and left. There was no way to go forward. Forward with the plans that I had made for my life, selfish plans, things that I wanted. I only began to want things for my children as they got older and I could see what they wanted. As I've said before, I wasn't the best dad in the world. Um, but that first moment that I held my firstborn is kind of the moment that I think about and try to explain to people when they ask me, well, what's the difference between this religion and this relationship thing you talk about? And I'll, I'll tell you one more R word that I think belongs in both, and that's respect people who are religious but perhaps don't have a relationship has a, have a great respect for their creator. And obviously respect is a given in any kind of relationship. In fact, I don't know if you can have a relationship with another being if there isn't mutual respect. Now, think about that for a minute. The opposite of respect would be disrespect, or let's go even farther, it would be maybe hate. I mean, if, if you don't respect someone, unless you're a racist, or you're a uh, Pharisee based on theology and denomination, if you hate somebody, it's probably a good chance it's because of something they've done or they've said to you. Can you respect someone you hate? I'll finish reading Jesus Calling, but I'll leave you with one thought. Do you respect Satan? Because you do have a relationship with him. You know that, don't you? 
push play. <clears throat> when you commune with me in the garden of your heart, both you and I are blessed. This is my way of living in the world through you. Together we will push back the darkness, for I am. I am. I am the light of the world. I didn't read this first. I always tell you I very rarely do. But I think it's interesting that it says that when you commune with me in the garden of your heart, both you and I are blessed. This is my way of living in the world through you. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. The, the, the basis of my conversation with you today was based on Moses. Because it was obvious to people that he had seen the face of God because his face glowed. Um, it, 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 it shone. There was a shine. There was a glow to it. So much so that Moses supposedly wore a veil for the rest of his born days after that first encounter on Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the tablets, the Ten Commandments. I shouldn't have said first encounter because God had, God and Moses had had time together before that. So how do people see Jesus in you? I work with a uh, young lady who is, um, oh, I think about eight months pregnant. And it's her second child. And she is um, a little older. She's not in her late teens or early 20s. And so this pregnancy is even a little more touchy for her than maybe perhaps most. Good morning, Gail. How are you? And some of the work that her and I do together can be somewhat a little strenuous, not, not a lot strenuous. We're not picking up 50-pound bags of flour. But some of the work can be strenuous. It can be standing on a ladder. It can be lifting a box that's maybe... 20 pounds, 25 pounds. And one of the ways that I show Jesus around her is almost like a father or a husband. I'm very, very cautious of what I allow her. Uh, that's the wrong word. I'm sorry. It's not my job to allow I, I encourage her to let me do some of the heavy lifting. Let's put it that way. Um, yesterday, for instance, we had a, a, a fairly large machine to move. Um, probably 25, 30 pound machine to move. And we were moving it away from a wall so we could clean behind it. And even though she forbid me, forbid is the wrong word, but you know, no, no, I can get it. I can get it. And then later she would say, I know you're trying to be careful for me because I'm expecting, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Now, this is not, as far as I can tell, a woman of faith. This is not a woman who attends a regular worship service. This is not someone who... Um, well, she doesn't realize it yet, but Jesus is going to mug her. Jesus is going to call her. I can tell by the way she talks about how her first child, a daughter who's about four, and this next child that she's going to have here shortly. And she talks about wanting to get them into some type of church or Sunday school. I recommend Sabbath school. And she kind of gives me that look like Picasso gives me when I say a word that he thinks he understands. You know, that, hmm, ruh-roh, hmm, goes 
head from side to side. But I digress. The point is that she doesn't necessarily know my faith by how I care for her because of her pregnancy. But I think she sees Jesus. I know she sees kindness, love, grace, and forgiveness. And those are the attributes that I believe Jesus brings to the table in a relationship with him. I believe he teaches us love because that comes from his father. I believe we understand grace because that's delivered. The delivery person of grace is the Holy Spirit. Grace is granted to us by the Father, but it is delivered by the grace delivery boy or girl. See, I, and some of you are going to yell blasphemy on this, but I think the Holy Spirit has a female gender, perhaps not plumbing, because it's a spirit. But I just believe that there's a little more of a female kindness, compassion, and nurturing to the Holy Spirit. That's just me. Call me weird. And then Jesus teaches us the love from his Father, the grace from the Holy Spirit, and then the forgiveness. Because that's the most important thing in that dude's life. I mean, that's why he came here as a baby born of virgin, had a three-year ministry, died on the cross to forgive all of our sins yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And because of that, we get the free gift of salvation. That's why he came. There's no doubt in my mind, and hopefully not yours, of what God's will for Jesus' ministry was. It was to come and teach people to love, have grace, and forgive. It, It was to share stories about his father, about the relationship that he has with his father about the way we should treat each other. And in the end, his parables of teaching, his instruction, sometime his condemnation, his correction of us can seem a little harsh, but that's how he loves us. My grandmother used to say to me, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it hurts you. You know, when she'd give me a switch on the backside or when she'd set me in the corner like I had a dunce cap on or when I was... She knew the things she could really do to get my attention to. She wouldn't let me have any cream pie. And for those of you that were raised around Methodists or even Mennonites... You know how good grandma's cream pie can be. I don't even know if it's made anymore, to be honest with you. I have the recipe at home, but I haven't made it in ages because I, to be honest with you, I'm kind of afraid to make it because it'll be such a disappointment and I'll lose that fantasy taste in my head of my grandmother's cream pie. There's no, there's no smell with the cream pie. I've thought about that before. I mean, I'm sure it had some type of aroma. Because many times we are recalled to our childhood through senses of smell. Senses of taste. I know there are things that when I see them, I think of my grandfather, grandmother. I'm still looking for this one little calendar she had, and it was about three inches high, and it was a black sphere that was supposed to be representing the globe. And when you turned it over, so it would just go clockwise over and over and over and over. But every day you'd turn it over, and it would show you the date. Not the month, just the date. And every morning my grandmother would take that, and she'd flip it 180 degrees. And on the other side would be the date. 
And then the next day she'd flip it again and there would be the date. And I look at places, you know, the secondhand stores, the picker knows, the... I, I look at all those places and try to find one of those. If you ever find one or you have one, I would be greatly blessed for you to allow me to purchase it from you because it is something that reminds me of my grandmother. So there are senses, there are smells, there are sights, there are songs. I can't hear a good gospel group without thinking of my grandmother. The Blackwood brothers, the Imperials, those were the people that she would take me to go see and I'd rush up as a young boy with my baby blue autograph book my mother or my grandmother bought me and I'd get their autograph and I still have that book by the way no I'm not a hoarder I just save things that are important to me so just as we can smell see taste be reminded of our own past I believe there are things that we have within us that the Holy Spirit brings to us that people see something unusual in us. Folks that know Jesus, I think see Jesus, smell Jesus, touch Jesus, hear Jesus, remember Jesus. But most importantly, those who don't know him have a relationship with him not even in their lives. Those are the people that I want my face to shine upon. If you think about Moses. Let me read you a little scripture this morning, if I can, please. I wrote, living in unveiled lifestyles is the way in which we experience the fullness of what's available to us in our restored relationship with God. It's a powerful lifestyle of faith, direct encounters with our Heavenly Father, and life transformation. It's when we live our lives in light, in the light of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus that we began to experience all his death and proposed to bring us. See, Jesus' death brings us the experience of his death and the purpose in which it was supposed to uh, mean to us, bring to us. God longs for his children, you and I, to walk in intimacy with him, directly connected to his wellspring of love for us. I love that word, by the way, wellspring. May you experience a more tangible, loving, and powerful connection with your Heavenly Father this day. Now, the scripture that talks a little bit about Moses, and there's more than just one, but the one particularly is Exodus 34, starting with verse 29. Moses did not know that his skin of his face shined or shone because he had been talking with God. What differences do people see in you when you've been talking with God? You ever think about that? Do people hear gentleness? Do they hear love? Do they smell? Now, here's a good one for you. Do they smell like the aroma of Jesus? Do you have a sense of smell for his presence in your life? I'll bet you do. You probably just haven't thought of it. For me, (laughs) don't laugh. It goes back to my grandma sugar cookies that that soft tender aroma of fresh sugar cookies coming out of the oven that's the aroma of Jesus 
Now, if I want to put words on it, it's love, grace, and forgiveness, of course. But if I want to give you something that you can relate to, the aroma, the smell, it's fresh baked sugar cookies. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in Exodus, and of course Moses wrote this, but he said, when I came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in my hand, and I came down from the mountain, I did not know that the skin of my face shone, shined, glowed, because I had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw me, And behold, they saw the skin of my face shining. And they were afraid to come near me in the beginning. But I called out to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation. I returned to them and I said, Hey, I saw the face of God. My face has changed. And when you see me, I want you to see the face of God because he's changed the way I will forevermore appear to you. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, to me in Mount Sinai. And when I had finished speaking to them, I put a veil over my face. And from this day forward, whenever I went in before the Lord to speak with him, I'll remove the veil until I come out. And when I come out and I tell people of Israel what God has commanded, the people of Israel will see the face of Moses, my face, and will see the skin of my face shining glowing like no others. And I would put the veil over my face again until I went back to speak to my Father in heaven. Now, I know I, I did that in first play or first uh, person, but I wanted you to hear Moses say it, not how it read from the Bible. Sometime when you're reading the Bible, I'm going I'm to just ask you to consider doing this. Sometime when you're reading the Bible and you can read it out loud and the words come up in red where Jesus spoke, speak it in first person as if you're Jesus talking to someone, sharing with someone, sharing the parables, talking about the miracles, talking about your father, talking about the happiness of following him. And try it in first person. And don't let anybody tell you that that's blasphemy or anything silly like that. You want to bless God? Be like his son. Be like him. Speak to someone as if you are Jesus. And maybe they will see Jesus, hear Jesus, smell Jesus, touch Jesus through you. I'm going to go back to second person now because I want to read the rest of what's written. You see, Moses serves as an important example to you and me. Moses was a man chosen to go before God on behalf of his people and relay the will and heart of God back to them. Do you ever do you ever try to do that with someone? God has laid on my heart blank 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 blank. There aren't a hundred things that God has laid on my heart in my lifetime but they are too many to number or to repeat 
accurately. I will tell you that God has laid on my heart the importance of the fourth commandment. Thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy. God has laid on my heart the importance of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. And I have learned that if I want to truly understand that first commandment, I will exchange or add the word idols. Thou shalt have no other idols but me. Because I do idolize God. He is at the top of the list. And no one, no one, nothing or no one comes before him. But you see, the devil tries. He whispers in our ear, Hey, that buffet, you can eat all you want. Then you can go sit and let it float into your legs. Then you can go back and eat some more. I mean, it's a buffet. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet, Mac. You have to get your money's worth. You have to get your value. You have to try everything on the buffet at least once. Oh, I, I, I know that's not good for your body. It's not good for your diet. It goes straight to your hips. But, yeah, let's, let's idolize food today. Let's idolize the sin of gluttony and selfishness and the lack of moderation. Now, I don't use that as something funny. I use that as something that I, I'm not going to tell you I struggle with it because I just simply don't go very often. But man, do I love buffets. And it's really not about the quantity. I know people think it is, but it's not now. I understand that the quantity is part of the consequence of going to a buffet. But if you were to see me sitting at one of my favorite buffets, you would see three or four, maybe five different things on my plate, and there would only be three or four spoonfuls for, full. So I don't get a plate and pile it high with whatever I love and then go back and sit down and eat that and then go get another plate and go back and pick a second item that I thoroughly love and fill my plate with it. And for me, that's a good way to look at something I can put above God. I used to put the consumption of alcohol above God. I used to put members of my own family above God. That by golly, come hell or high water, I'll make sure that my wife, my daughter, my son, my grandkids are safe and anyone wants to mess with them, they can mess with me first, right? Put God first in your marriage. Put God first in the relationship with your children and your grandchildren. When I get the opportunity and I use the word opportunity because I really do enjoy this part of my ministry, when I get the opportunity to sit down with a couple who are considering or are planning marriage, the most important piece of wisdom that I can pass on from God is the following. Don't give all your love to your spouse. No, don't. Give all your love to Jesus. And Jesus will show you and tell you and instruct you which part of that love you're to pass forward to the one you're marrying same goes with your children. I was speaking to a person the other day whose wife had uh, just lost so much of who she was because her own, her own son died. And I shared with you the last few days the relationship I had with a woman who I call Fargo because she was from Fargo. And how the the woman just died inside when her daughter was murdered. And I'm not saying it shouldn't hurt that much. I've, I, I witnessed that kind of hurt. 
I didn't love her daughter like she loved her daughter, but I loved her daughter. She was part of my family. And when she died, a part of me died with her. But it's not a part that Jesus couldn't heal. He can't bring her back. Abby's gone. Maybe your son or daughter's gone. Maybe it's your mother or father or a sibling that you've lost. But I find that people who have a relationship with Jesus when they get married, or people who have a relationship with Jesus when they lose someone, they have a much greater sense of peace in the way that relationship with a spouse or other people when a loved one dies unexpectedly and before their time. There's a peace that we know it's not our hand that caused it, that it's God's will. And if it wasn't his will for, in this case, I'll say Abby to die, it was part of his plan because he needed to rescue her. Sometimes I have found the best thing you can say to somebody who's lost a child or someone they love unexpectedly, and certainly before their time. God came and rescued them. He knew what was ahead. He could see the future. He is the future. And he didn't want your loved one to suffer through that ever, ever again. And so... He rescued, he rescued Abby. He rescued your loved one. He brought them to the peace of a restful sleep. And one day Jesus will return and we will be awakened and we will walk again. And we will spend time with our creator and the loved ones around us who have chosen an eternity with that creator also. So don't give all your love to any human being. Give all your love to Christ, and then he will show you what part of that love goes, can be shared, can be given to another human being. And that's another way that God, or I'm sorry, that's another way that people see God within us. When we don't allow our lives to just crumble because of a loss we weren't expecting, hadn't planned, and didn't want. I'm embarrassed to say the next statement, but I say it because if you also have experienced this same thing, I want you to know, I want you to know that it's a part of life and that God himself walks with you the entire time that you experience this. And what I'm speaking about is when my life, uh, I'm sorry, when my wife, I want you to know of, you know, 30 some years, decided she didn't want to be married to a man of God. And that was her quote, by the way. I didn't handle it well. I certainly didn't show God's love or Jesus's love in my life. I showed the opposite. I showed... Mm. anger. I showed the feeling of abandonment and betrayal. I wore the wounds on my sleeves, in my words, in my actions. Now, I'm not proud of that, but I tell you those things because maybe you needed to hear that somebody else fell apart at the worst time in their life also. Maybe you needed to hear 
that as humans, we truly do have sinful nature. And gosh darn it, that sinful nature comes plowing out sometimes like a herd of buffalo across the open plain. And the dust kicks up. And the tumbleweed rolls. It's okay. It's not okay that we fall apart. But it's okay that people see it. Because they also see God in that. And you say, now wait a minute, hold on, Mac. You're telling me that people see Jesus when other people are falling apart? Yeah. Because eventually they see us climbing out of the pit, pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps, putting ourselves back together, and regaining a walk with God in our lives rather than a walk away from God in our lives. I think people see God in our lives in our smiles, which really makes wearing a mask suck. I can't see smiles. Oh, every once in a while I can, but not really. I'm not really seeing it. I'm just seeing the, the face change a little and maybe the eyes change and maybe there's a nod, but I can't see the teeth shining. I can't see the smile. Now this doesn't give me any right to ask you or to tell you that you <laughs> should not wear a mask. I, I, I'm not politically involved in this mess at all, but smiles are something I miss during this time in our lives. I miss hugs. And you want to you wanna show somebody the love of Jesus? Give them a hug. I know right now that's not cool. And if you want to, give them a Mac hug. It's called a second half hug. Because, see, when we're embraced by someone, there is that moment. One second. Two seconds three seconds in which many times there's a tap on the back or they begin to pull away and we know well that hugs over with but see if you hug me or if I give you a hug you get a second half hug and that's when most would expect you to pull away to tap on the back to rear away you tighten the grip a little. I'm not saying you give them a bear hug and pick them up. But let them know that this hug isn't done yet. That there's more of this where that came from. The second half hug. Not to steal it from Coca-Cola in the 60s, but try it, you'll like it. Something else that we don't do near enough anymore is we don't reach out and shake hands. We don't reach out and put our hands on the shoulder of somebody and say, good job. I really like what you did there. That was really good. Thank you. See, those are words that are powerful. Sometimes we only use the term words are powerful when they're meant to hurt. You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, if you choose to let them hurt you, they will hurt you, and that's a hurt that you're going to feel. But words can also be powerful in a very blessing way, a very positive way. And we need to use those words as often as we can. 
We need to use those powerful words to make a connection. A connection that Jesus is present. How do you show that Jesus is present? Is, is it when you say to somebody, God bless you? Uh, that's great. But I hope that's not it. When you smile at someone, sending them a feeling of warmth and nurturing and caring, is that enough? No, but it helps. When you just, for out of the blue, pull out your phone and you text someone or call someone, calling's always better. To just say, I'm just checking up on you. Just seeing how you're doing. Sometimes God lays on my heart someone's name. And I just need to reach out to him. And I used to say something like, well, God laid on my heart that I should reach out and check on you. No, he didn't. He laid on my heart that I should reach out to you and tell you that I love you. And you're loved by Jesus. And even though you may not believe in him, he believes in you. How do people see that you love Jesus? Maybe it's a wristband. What would Jesus do? Gosh, I hated those wristbands. I didn't hate them. I just, I don't know. I think the devil used them. I think the devil used them to fight a war against us. Well, so you wear the bracelet. What would Jesus do? So would Jesus do what you're doing? I don't think so. I don't need pharisaical judgment like that. And that leads me to this point. It's hard to show people that you know and love Jesus because there are those piece of feces people that will immediately find everything you say and do somehow not acceptable to their Jesus, even though they have no idea who he is. Well, Jesus wouldn't do that. Well, I... I just, I want to say to those people, in fact, I have said, how do you know? You don't know him. But see, now I've, 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 I've added insult to injury. Now I've started an argument. And Jesus is the center of it. And I don't think he wants to be in that position. Do you? I feel like the church lady when I say that. I don't think he wants you to be in that position. Do you? See, sometimes it's better that while we keep our relationship with Jesus to ourselves. I've told you that I dislike John 3.16 very, very much because it gives people the idea that all you got to do is believe in Jesus and you're good. Another Bible verse that I really don't like, go to the closet and pray where no one can hear you or see you. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. That's not correct in the big picture. Jesus doesn't want to remain anonymous to other people in your life. He wants to reveal himself through you. He wants people to see the difference in you because you love him. kind of like that pregnant lady I told you that I worked with. I know, I know, because we've talked about it. I know that I do things in which she goes, oh, that's got to be a Jesus thing. And every once in a while she says it. Oh, okay, that's a Jesus thing, isn't it? And she's not mocking me. I know the tone of a mocker. She's not mocking me. She's just kind of, I don't know, letting me know that she knows that 
I'm touching her heart in a very positive way, a way that I don't think she'll ever remember. I'm sorry, I don't think she'll ever forget. I think it will be passed on to her children in some way. Oh, I don't think she'll ever bring up my name. And that's not important. The only name I wanted to bring up is, you know, I knew this guy. I don't remember his name, but you could tell that he loved Jesus. Ah, now the name that counts is said out loud. But he knew Jesus. Ooh, yeah. Moses was a man that God chose to go be to go in front of his people on behalf of him and show them the will and love that God had for their lives. And by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are now chosen and transformed to live out that same calling. Go to feast. For, feast. Go to First Peter, chapter two, verse nine, with me for a moment. First Peter, chapter two, verse nine. Peter declare declares that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that we, you, I, may proclaim the excellence of him who calls us out of the darkness and into the amazing light. Jesus. See, God can bear that image of our Heavenly Father and declare His grace, love, forgiveness, and power, and especially His goodness to the world in desperate need of a relationship with Him. What happens to Moses in Exodus 34 obviously holds true for you and me today. When, when, when we meet with God, we take on that image of his glory. We take on that smile. We take on that hug. We take on that caress. We take on those kind words, those powerful words. I love you. You are loved. You may not believe in God, but he believes in you. And one of my favorite lines, you are loved. Blessings, you are loved. See, the difference is that the glory of God now dwells internally rather than externally. This because of the power of the sacrifice of Jesus. As Moses' face shone with the glory of God, our new nature is now meant to shine, declaring the immeasurable, immeasurable grace and the power of Jesus' sacrifice. One more Bible verse, then I'm done. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 and 7. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in your hearts, our hearts, my hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The glory of God now dwells within you. You, Gail. You, Darren. You, James. You, Sharon. You, Les. You, Mac. The glory of God now dwells within us, and we are, we are certain to contain this glory and pour it out through love and grace and forgiveness to all that we encounter. Just as the people of Israel saw the face of Moses and knew that he had met with God. We are to meet with our Heavenly Father face to face and be transformed by his presence for all of us to see. 
See, Jesus' death has paved the way for you to meet God face to face, unveiled. There is no curtain. There is no high priest that you have to go through. There is no separation of you and God no longer. Jesus did that in his death. The curtain fell, the world rumbled, the lightning struck, and the darkness came upon the earth because life had just changed forever. A relationship with Jesus, the creator, is now possible for you and me. Jesus' death has paved the way for you to meet God face to face, unveiled. Take time in prayer to see the face of God and allow him to transform you into the likeness of him, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit that abides within us. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to let you know that I am delivering the message to the uh, Des Moines Church tomorrow, Sabbath. We're going to do it outside, and Ed Wilson promises me it'll be breezy, no clouds, no rain, and very comfortable. It's the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Watrous, just a couple blocks west of Skip's Restaurant there off of Fleur. We'll be social distancing, and it's going to kind of talk about what we talked about today, only go farther. It's going to talk about how God sees us, not how we see God how God sees us. Today I talked about how I want God to be seen in your eyes, in your hug, in your touch, your smell, your aroma, your everything. But tomorrow I'm going to share with you the power, the incredible power that God has to see you. And we're going to talk about the people in the Bible Jesus saw and God saw and ultimately it'll come down to the universal message of Christianity love grace and forgiveness and oh yeah the other one Jesus is calling you Jesus is calling you to his side, to his bosom, to hold hands with him, to walk with him, to laugh with him, to cry with him. Jesus is calling you to please. He's pleading with you. Give me your worries. Give me your ailments. Give me your pain. Give me your fears. I died on the cross so you could give them to me one-on-one in a relationship with me. I am no longer separated by a curtain or a cloth or a high priest or a Pharisee or any other type of religion that people want to put between us, God, and me. Tomorrow, hopefully, God will speak through me and you will see and hear the way God is calling you. And remember, for those of us who enjoy a little self-deprecating, did I say that word right? I think I did. God doesn't call from the pulpit. He doesn't call from the highest mountain. He calls from the deepest pit. And he's calling you. Amen. Amen. This is KPOG, Grimes, West Des Moines, and webcast1live.com. Thanks for watching. I love you.